Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 41 to 45. So first, I'll show you guys a question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 41, 42, 43, 44, and 45. All right, now let's go through the questions together so that we can attempt them and answer them together. Here's question 41. In 41, it says, which of the following laboratory techniques would allow for separation of enantiomers? So we want to use a technique to separate enantiomers. So with enantiomers, you have to remember that they have different ways in which they react with light. So they have different optical activity. However, they do have other properties being the same because they have the same elements that are making up the molecule and they have the same connections between the elements as well. So because of that, they have the same intermolecular forces and therefore distillation would not be good for separating enantiomers because this is based on boiling point and enantiomers will have pretty much the same boiling point. Chiral chromatography, yes, that would be good. So chiral chromatography is a specific type of chromatography that is used for differentiating based on chirality, and then this can actually separate enantiomers. You don't really have to know the theory behind this type of chromatography, as you kind of should with other types of chromatography, like size, size exclusion chromatography and affinity chromatography, but you just need to know that chiral chromatography is very good for separating things based on chirality, and that's the main thing which differs between enantiomers, so this is the correct answer. Electrophoresis, same thing. This is based on separating things due to charge, and that is going to be the same in enantiomers. Affinity chromatography binds to specific substances which the resin of the column has an affinity for, and once again, enantiomers are going to react in a similar way, so they should have similar affinity as well. So B is the best answer for question 41. In question 42, we are asked which of the following reactions necessarily inverts the stereochemistry of the compound. So we're looking for a reaction which inverts stereochemistry. And for this, you should characteristically know that SN2 reactions are the ones that invert stereochemistry. So in an SN2 reaction, you have a leaving group. And at the same time, you have a nucleophile coming in. But it comes and does a backside attack on the carbon at which we have SN2 occurring. And that means that it's coming from the other side to where the leaving group is pointing, which inverts the stereochemistry. So it goes from R if it's starting R to S, or if it's starting as S, it goes to R. So SN2, they specifically are known to invert stereochemistry, whereas in SN1s, we do not just invert stereochemistry. What we have is a leaving group leave, and then we have a, pole, a planar intermediate called a carbocation, and then that can be attacked from either the top or bottom face, giving us a racemic mixture of both the R and S form, both of the enantiomers, and therefore one of them will retain stereochemistry because it'll be the same as the starting stereochemistry, but one of them will be the inverted stereochemistry. And so since we don't get just the inverted one, we can't say that SN1 necessarily inverts stereochemistry. Same with E2. What E2 does is it removes the leaving group and then also removes the hydrogen and gives us a double bond. Therefore, we don't have that original stereochemistry and then we don't have a new type of stereochemistry. We don't have either R or S and therefore that's different and it's not the same as inverting stereochemistry. So it's going to be only SN2 reactions for this question. Moving on to question 43. This question says that a structural isomer is noted to have what? So we are talking about structural isomers and the definition of these isomers is that they have the same chemical formula except the ways in which the, at the atoms are attached might be different. For example, we can have propanol with the OH group at carbon three, and then everything else will just be hydrogens. We can actually, this will be carbon one, not carbon three. So at either the terminal carbons, or we could have it in the middle carbon. And then once again, everything else is just hydrogens. And so for these two molecules, their chemical formula or molecular forma formula is the same but the way in which the atoms are attached, those connections might be rearranged. These are structural isomers. So option A is saying a slightly different molecular formula to the original molecule, but the same general configuration of atoms. 
No, that's incorrect. You don't have a slightly different molecular formula. You have the exact same one. Option B, saying a difference in the chirality at exactly one chiral center. No, that would be talking about stereoisomers, which don't differ by moving atoms around to different places in the molecule, but rather how those those bonds are oriented in 3D space. So that's a different type of isomer. Option C is saying every stereocenter opposite to the original molecule. This is talking about enantiomers. Once again, talking about stereocenters and things moving around in 3D space, That those are stereoisomers, not structural isomers. So it's talking about something else. So option D is correct. They, are ident they have an identical molecular formula. That's correct to the original molecule. Yeah, that's one of the key parts that they have the same molecular formula. And then the second part is that just those atom connections are rearranged. In question 44, it says during atomic, atomic absorption spectroscopy, the concentration of certain atoms can be measured in very low concentrations. The absorption is attuned to the optical, to the optimal absorption wavelength of individual metals. Will atomic absorption spectroscopy be useful for the measurement of ethanol in pure water? So in this question, we're talking about atomic absorption spectro spectroscopy. And then even if you don't know what that is, it's kind of defined here for us. And then you have to understand the definition, which is saying that it can measure some things in very low concentrations, but specifically it's tuned to the optimal absorption wavelength of specific metals. And we are asked, can this help us detect how much ethanol there is in pure water? But with ethanol, you know that it is two carbons together and then an OH, and then everything else is just hydrogens. That's ethanol. And then water is, of course, H2O. In both of these compounds, there are no metals. There are just covalent bonds. There are no metals. There are no charges. And then there might be like metal counter ions to balance those charges. There's nothing like that going on. So these two molecules, when they're dissolved in each other, there are no metals present. And if we're told that atomic absorption spectroscopy specifically relies on identifying wavelengths of metals to find out concentration of a, of a certain species, then we can't use this type of spectroscopy because metals aren't even present. So we're asked, will this spectroscopy be useful for the measurement of ethanol pure water? Option is saying yes, because a mixture of ethanol and water does not have metal ions. It would actually be no, but the rest is correct. That mixture does not have metal ions. Option B is saying yes, because ethanol and water mixtures contain metal ions. No, they, they do not. Option C is saying no, because a mixture of ethanol and water does not have metal ions. That would be our correct answer. And finally, option D is saying no, because ethanol and water mixtures contain metal ions, but that is incorrect. So this question essentially just requires that you look at this new information presented to you a new type of spectroscopy that you may not be familiar with, just understand what its key function is, what the main thing it's looking for, and then see if the certain solu the solution that we're given has that requirement. And if we know that this requires metals and our solution does not contain metals, then this should be a pretty easy question to solve. Now in question 45, we're asked, which of the following has an overall molecular dipole moment? So which one has a dipole moment? So to figure this out, first of all, you need to know if the molecule has any dipoles. And then secondly, you need to think about its 3D structure and think if the dipoles cancel out or not. So first of all, we have benzene, which is just six carbons. So it'll just look like this. So those are six carbons attached to each other and then everything else is a hydrogen. But in a benzene, we do not have any well, it would look like this. In a benzene, we do not have, we only have carbons and hydrogen, so we do not, we do not have anything that is a dipole bond, a bond with a dipole. In carbon dioxide, we have carbon. So in benzene, of course, all those carbons are also attached to hydrogens. In option B, we have carbon with oxygens, and therefore there is a dipole. However, those two dipole moments cancel out because carb carbon dioxide is an overall linear molecule. So if we have a dipole going to the left, we also have a dipole moment going to the right and they're the same. So they cancel each other out. Therefore, this molecule does not have an overall dipole moment. So B is incorrect. Option C though, this is methyl chloride, which means that we have one chloride 
and then the other things attached to this carbon are hydrogens and therefore we have a dipole moment going up and that is correct methyl chloride does have an overall dipole because you have that one chloride and there isn't another dipole moment that is canceling this out therefore you do have an overall dipole moment going towards where the chloride is so this molecule does have an overall dipole moment and then finally option d acetylene that's another name for this eth ethylene which is two carbons bonded to each other but they're carbons which means they're the same element so there is no overall dipole moment so only c is the one which has a dipole moment which is not balanced out by anything else therefore c has an overall molecular dipole moment that's it for the questions in this video if you enjoyed what you saw make sure to check out our course the link is in the description below and in that course we go through a lot more questions and go through all the different answer options explaining why each one is right or wrong otherwise if you like what we're posting on this youtube channel make sure to subscribe and then you're going to keep up to date with all the videos that we post here that's it for this video i'll see you guys in the next one